This is Lauren Schoenberg. I'm kind of chagrined almost to share this interview, and I'll tell you why. I was in my mid-twenties when I was introduced to Artie Shaw, and I went out, heard his new big band led by Dick Johnson in Westchester for a couple of nights, and then asked him if I could interview him for my radio show that I was doing at WKCR-FM at the time. The amazing thing about this interview uh, is his willingness to talk, to argue, to think with a kid in his mid-twenties who had not thought things out too clearly, and I must say uh, he suffered this fool quite gladly. But nonetheless, this will give you an insight into the mind of R.D. Shaw. First of all, uh, are we on now? Yeah, we're on. All right. First, I ought to make a point, I think. You know, I do these seminars out in California. You teach in order to learn. If you don't learn, you're not teaching well. And by learning, I mean you're hearing whether you are or are not communicating what you mean, and you're hearing whether the communication is or is not on the button. If it isn't, it's very clear to you that maybe you haven't thought your way through. So teaching is a very learning experience. I've learned several things during these courses that I've been doing. It's been the last 10 years I've been doing it. Before that, I did a lot of lectures. I went out on lecture tours. Now, I don't like to lecture because uh, you're presuming too much when you lecture. I don't know what those people expect from me. I mean, as you said, there have been many facets to my life. And uh, usually I start out by laying out roughly, here I am, this is how I got here, this is where I, this is where I am right now. And uh, what would you like to hear about? So they ask me questions. Sometimes one question, sometimes three questions can provide the basis of the whole lecture. And it can last two hours explaining that. Uh, you raised a point here about the facets and so on, about the different things besides music I've been interested in. One of the things I've learned, and I say it over and over to people, some people get it, some don't. That's always true, whether you play or talk or whether you paint or sculpt. Uh, the more you know about everything, the richer anything you do will be. Now, it may not be apparent to the obvious listener or viewer, if you're a painter or a writer, uh, but it's there. The points of reference, your referent points, become more numerous and more varied and more profound. So when you see into things, you make allusions to other things, mm -hmm. and you're not aware of it all the time. But your mind jumps, you know, it be becomes discursive. Mm -hmm. And no. discursiveness is good, because you're not stuck to a single theme. And when you play a piece of music, for example, that Stardust thing, uh, I don't know where that came from. It was a one-take record. It just felt good that night, and I could hear it. And, you know, somebody once asked me, do you realize, in the People magazine, there's a piece, uh, I mean, in this story is told. The critic asked me, "Do you realize that, that? Did you realize? Do you realize that that chorus you played on Stardust has become a classic?" I said, "I knew it the minute I played it," and I quoted William Blake, who was once uh, taken to task because he threw a well wisher out of his house. And somebody said, "How can you do that? You're living in penury. You and your wife are almost totally broke. How can you throw somebody out?" Who he said, "Well, he criticized one of my works." And the guy said, well, "What do you mean, criticize? He's he's one of your benefactors. Doesn't he have a right?" He said, "Look." How can a man be a genius and not know it? Meaning he knew exactly what he was doing. He didn't need criticism. I feel the same way. I don't mean that I'm above criticism. That sounds too arrogant, and it isn't arrogant. On the other hand, if you're not arrogant, how dare you think you can make a living in art? Yes. You have to be pretty arrogant to think that you've got something to say to the world that they will support you for in an impractical world like art. Yeah. Well, that's the meaning of those courses, three courses for beauty's sake and one to pay the rent. Really, it's usually four for the rent for most people. I've got it down to one or two for the rent, which is pretty good. I mean, very few people can say that they've got their work to the point where uh, they can pay the rent with a minimal amount of time. And now it's just got mostly royalties. Well, then let, let, let me ask, ask you a question on those lines, and then maybe we'll get to some of these earlier recordings and some questions I have about your early days. Okay, you know what you're doing. You did it. How you know it? Did. Here I am sitting here with, with Artie Shaw, the man that made the record, and uh, whose musical concept uh, has become so popular with an artistic base. Well, you have to understand, but, let, let me but, interrupt but, for okay, a moment yeah, to say, ahead. because you, you brought something I've not quite finished with. Mm -hmm. uh, when I talk about arrogance and I talk about doing what you have to do, and that, you know, I really mean that I am trying, I know what I'm doing, it's taken me most of my life to find out what my particular thumbprint is. Most people don't understand it, but that's what an artist's job is, to develop himself into his own personal thing in public, unfortunately. He has to do the development in public. So we take people very often, we scold them or we chide them for not doing as well as we think they should. Uh, and the statement isn't they're not doing what we think what we think they should do. 
Well, they're not doing what we think what we, we might do if we were what they, we think they are. It's that involuted. I mean, you know, a man like Hemingway writes a book like Across the River into the Trees, which is almost senile. And everybody jumps on him. Oh, the old guy's through, he's finished. Well, look what happens after. That was on his way in his evolution to prune the bell tolls, which is a masterpiece. So you cannot, you can't judge people on everything. I do believe, and this is very strong conviction, that an artist has the same right as an athlete to, remember, to be remembered for his best work. Mm -hmm. We don't remember Roger Bannister's flops. We know he broke the four minute mile. We know that Babe Ruth, we don't know how many times he struck out. We know he hit a hell of a lot of home runs. Hank Aaron's the same. The trick is that when you see Bob Beeman jump 29 feet and, and odd, odd uh, 29 plus, we don't remember his failures. He's never done it since, never done it again. But the point is, when you do that, it's not an accident. That thing of Stardust finally come full circle. Yeah. The thing on Stardust was not something that happened by accident. My entire career had led me to that moment. Yeah. Same thing with anything you do. Very few people on earth can say, I've done something so well that I know no one can do it better. I can point to two things in my entire career where I can say, that is something nobody on earth can do as well or better. They can copy it, but that's not as good. And what, and what are those two things? Well, there's a record, a Decca record, very hard to find, uh, of these foolish things with a big band in which I played a cadenza at the mm -hmm. end. Of it. That is, you can't do better clarinet. No one on earth can play the clarinet better than that. That's all there is to it. I mean, I've played it all my life. I know when it's good. I also know when I'm very uncomfortable with it. Right. Some of the records I've made that people ask me to play, I don't like them too much. Well, they say, that's one of your biggest records. That isn't the point. Well, now okay, now we're in, we're in a very in interesting situation. You're talking about art. You're bringing up the names of a lot of great artists. But not. I'm not sure if any of them have found themselves in the specific circumstance in which you find yourself now, where you're leading a band that is presenting your artistic view through, you, through your arrangements or, or arrangements that you had a hand in or, or, or that you sketched out over the years, but that you yourself as an artist are not participating in the sense of as an instrumentalist, although your band is still playing. Now, let's hey, take... Now let's a band is an instrument. I'm playing an instrument here. Okay, fine. You know, it's, it happens to be... I've given okay. up on the clarinet because that would kill me if I went back right, to that. Right, right. You know, I mean, my compulsions to play that instrument were so overpowering that I'd be dead by now. If I tried to go, it's like people say, don't you miss it? Of course, you'd miss a gangrenous right arm if you had it cut off, but the arm would kill you if you kept it on. So you'd take, all right, I will live with one arm rather than try, die with both. Okay. It's that simple. I heard you refer in, in yesterday's performance to the fact that these arrangements are classics. They go beyond their time. They, they are for all time. They're art. And I guess that's one of the basic definitions of art is that it can transcend this particular time and place to a kind of universal. Not only that, but it does fact. more than is required of it. Okay, now let's. Let, let's say, just for argument's sake, you take a production of Hamlet. Fine. Yeah, right. Some people have taken a show like that and moved it out of... Oh, out of its period. Out of its period, take yeah, it up... To prove that the issues into are Brooklyn, contemporary. To take it They're timeless. Into Brooklyn in so, the 1950s with a bunch of guys walking around talking exactly. like this. And it works. gangsters. Arson Wells did that. And it works. Of course. Of course okay. it works because it always was valid. Okay, now let me ask you what your feeling is behind what's going on here, let's say with your band now, we're in a sense, we're involved in the same kind of endeavor, however the settings really haven't changed. Now I've heard you say that these things, all they were, uh, most of those jam uh, tunes that you wind up jamming on, that they were just meant as uh, Frame frameworks. Room. Yeah, Okay. armature, like a sculpture has an armature. Okay. You hang it on there. Is what we're having here sometimes with, with the band, like and again this is far afield from what I want to get into ma mainly, okay. but since you mentioned these things, I, I, I'd, I'd love, love to take the opportunity to ask you about them. Uh, are we delving here in a, in a stage production of Hamlet set back in, in, in pre-Elizabethan times with some contemporary uh, dialogue in? When you present these arrangements, let's say you have your Lady Be Good or your Soft as a Morning Sunrise, mm -hmm. and of course you have Les Robinson, or you have Tony Pass, or you have uh, George, George, a George Aris, or whoever was going to come out and, and play a solo on that thing. Yeah. And the solos and the whole general feeling of what they were playing was so interwoven with the arrangement because at it, that time, at that time, because right. as you said, you knew each man in the band, you taught a lot, and people like Les Robinson, I would assume you pretty much taught how to play. Well, I gave him a mouthpiece, and oh. I told him, when you can blow that mouthpiece Please. without breaking your jaw, you'll be sounding right. Okay. And all of a sudden, overnight, it okay. happened. Okay. So, so how do you view, let's say, the performances of the Artie Shaw band here in 1984? Do you think that we're delving in? In, in, a, in a situation that's, an, that's analogous to what I was saying with Hamlet and moving it, but not with moving the setting, because you still have those old those frameworks from, let's say, 40 years well, ago that deal with a specific melodic vocabulary. Right, but we're mixing things switch. up here. 
misunderstand that the notes on the paper are written notes. They're not the music. And these people don't play those written notes as the old fellows did. They don't phrase them in the same way. They're phrased in a quite modern and contemporary way. You see, piece of music, it's like the old semantic expression, the map is not the territory. The notes are not the music. The notes are an indication. When Chopin wrote his improvisations and called them etudes or called them nocturnes or whatever they might have been, he wasn't asking you to play just those notes. He was putting those notes down to give you an idea of what it was like when he, actually the best way you could imitate him would not be not to imitate him. Of course. Him. Somebody once, I remember Charlie Barnett once had a band that imitated Duke. That's and right. he asked me to hear it. And they imitated Duke solo for solo, note for note. He said, what do you think? I said, well, it's, you're not imitating Duke at all. He said, what do you mean? Note for note. I said, but Duke doesn't do that. <laughs> Duke hires guys and lets them go their way. You're hiring guys and tell them to go Duke's way. That's not at all getting the meaning of Duke. So yes. that's what I'm trying to say here. So My music way. is a framework. Mm -hmm. I'm play, all right, begin the beginning is kind of a classic thing. I can't change the notes of the tune, but they play them with an entirely different, a contemporary sensibility, if you will. It's mm -hmm. a little pompous. Let's say they play well, them like guys of today. Yes. And they phrase them differently. If you listen note, to, note for note to Softly as the Morning Sunrise, as we just played, or say Lady Be Good, or, or Begin, or Stardust, these fellas play them differently. Dick is playing my solo more or less note for note, but the other guys aren't. The right. guy who plays trumpet isn't playing the Billy blue isn't playing Billy Butterfield. He's following the pattern. Right. Uh, rock, Cicero, and trombone is following Jack Kenny's pattern, solo goes but on. he goes his own way. Dick, for some reason, has a great deal of admiration for that solo, so he plays it note for note. But I tell him, go where you want, and well, most of the players doing right. that. But but then there's 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 a track which you could follow which. Dick Johnson is 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 uh, what Dick Johnson doing? I, I think is saying that not only is your record of Stardust great and, and your arrangement of Stardust great, but your solo in a sense is a yeah. composition. Well, that happens in along the, with the lines of it. So okay, so then. But on Lady Be Good, he's going his own way. Right. Once he how does that sound to you? But how does that sound to to Artie Shaw? I, I have a question. When, when you have the ba, ba, da, 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 and then he goes that, his own way, and then the band comes in yeah. and takes off. Yeah. Uh, how? For me, for me, that's very gratifying because you, it proves the validity of the of the concept. An arrangement's only a concept. An you take is, Beethoven's Fifth, let's say, and and use contemporary well, techniques. No, you can't compare the two things. However, it's quite possible to conceive of playing, say, a Paganini Caprice and playing it with the modern techniques and playing it differently. I'll tell you this much: nobody plays the Mozart Concerto at the tempo he originally had it at. That's true. Because modern uh, instrumental techniques have improved. The instruments themselves respond quicker, so you can play with different tempos. Also, you can play within the confines of what the composer intended. There's a lot of room for difference. The difference between a Furtwängler or a Toscanini mm -hmm. or a Bruno Walter mm -hmm. or a Salty, mm -hmm. a, rain, a, a version of the Beethoven Fifth, would be astounding. Yeah, but in a, but in a much more subtle notes. way, but well, in a much more subtle way, and 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 in a very much more minute sense. Than the, the, the moment we have in other words, here. you're saying the road is narrower. There isn't as much room to move from around it's, from side to it's, side. It's narrower, but it might be greater because, as you know, when 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 you're dealing in such subtlety, you know, there might be room for more change if you're dealing exactly. With, you know, with but see, it's we're talking about quantitative, qualitative thing here, and it's very difficult to get into this without getting highly philosophical and technical. I think for the you can get as technical as you want with us. All right, by but the way. for the purposes of you know, without boring our listener to death, you, know, you, you won't be boring our listeners. All right, the point I'm making here is, I think, that one cannot, uh, one cannot stick with the actual interpretation of 38 in 1984. So when we play tunes like, well, to, just now, we played Moonbook, we played the chart, but it's a different sound, even the instruments, even the way they play today. Mm -hmm. These guys are differently trained musicians, they're conservatory trained mostly, most of them are Berkeley or whatever school they've gone to, so when they play, it's a much different bite. The other thing I must make a point on is, in the old days, in 38, when I did a lot of arrangements for my band, let's say Back Bay Shuffle, which we haven't played here, we've played it once or twice now. We change tunes so we won't bore ourselves to death. You know, you the audience would be happy if we stayed the same set. But let's say back bass shuffle. It ends on an E flat for first trumpet. High E flat on trumpet, which means D flat concert. Okay. Uh, in those days when I wrote an E flat, I knew I was stretching a guy who was outside limits. He could barely make that E flat. So I wrote it only at the end of the pop 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 pa that was the E flat. All right. Today these guys play G's and A's and B's above that. So today they don't just play the E flat, they say, How do you want it? My guys could just barely get through it. 
The same thing with many of the technically thing, difficult things we had. If you listen to an arrangement like, say, My Heart Stood Still, mm -hmm. the, the last chorus, the trumpets go da 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 that's very hard for trumpet players to do. Today they do that like walking because they, you know, I was playing, fooling around with one of the guy's trumpets the other day. The springs are different. Ever sure. since Dizzy and that whole rapid fire school of player, uh, a trumpet player came along, uh, the springs on trumpet player, trumpets have changed. Mm -hmm. The manufacturers had to change the instrument to meet the requirements of the musicians. So things have changed. It's not very obvious, but it's there. When you hear this band now, if you listen to any of the arrangements we play, I don't care if it's Stardust or any of the classic ones, any of the mm -hmm. so-called standard brands ones, yeah. you listen to the old record, listen to the modern one, it's a totally different thing. Summertime's sure. a totally different thing. Yes, it is. Now that was written in 43, that's 41 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Eddie, neither Eddie nor I knew we were creating, creating a lasting form of art. I once in a while say to the audience, it's a very gratifying feeling to realize that you've created a fairly durable piece of Americana, which we have. But we didn't know we were doing it. Just as I don't think Beethoven sat down and said, I'm going to write a classic. Of course. He wrote a sonata. Yeah. It happened to be, we call it the Moonlight Sonata. But he didn't call it. He didn't There's call the, the he four. didn't think of fate knocking at the door when he wrote da 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 da. That was a good thing. Yeah. If you look at one of his themes, the second movement in uh, Opus 110, Piano Sonata, there's a slow movement. Well, I've looked at his notebooks. He took five years to write that seemingly simple, slow melody. And the reason it took five years is that he wasn't writing a melody, he was creating an acorn out of which a tree could grow. Yeah. So if you listen to that quietly and, and, and study it, you'll realize that he went back and revised that thing over and over in view of where he wanted it to go at the same time without ruining where he was. It's a complicated the thing. I was a theory major at Manhattan and we spent, no so forget, you know spending it. six months on that? On Beethoven's Fifth. Oh, six months. Easily, easily. On everything comes back, you know. It, 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 it's really I tell you something, you could write the same book, you could write the same symphony, you could write the same arrangement for a jazz band for the rest of your life and keep improving it. Uh, if you, I don't know if you, you, you may not have heard my new record, Stardust, on, not new, it was on 30 years ago, but the one that was just released on Book of the Month. No, well, you know, that. I made one in 38. It was taken off the air. That was kind of a swingy arrangement, and it was a good arrangement. I listen to it now. I'm not in the slightest degree embarrassed by it. I mean, that's going to stand up just the way it is, in its own terms. Right. Uh, just as, you know, people can't criticize Mozart because he doesn't sound like Bartok. Bartok is 20th century, Mozart's 17th century. Different colors, right. different people, different times. But the point is, I can listen to that old star. It doesn't say that is excellent of its kind. Now the one in 40, which took off and has sold God knows how many umpteen millions. All right, but then you'd say that should be enough. But no, I did one for the book of the month, and, and I did that in 54. Right. And if well, you listen to that right. arrangement, that version with a small group, one of the reviewers said, Artie Shaw turned Stardust inside out on that one. Well, if you listen to it, it's very along the lines of the 40 record. I didn't want to uh, transgress too much. I didn't want to start out by violating that, that mm -hmm. concept. But then we took it as far as I could go at that time. And I can say to you that the tours I played on that, I don't think you can do it better. No. I don't, I don't, if you listen to it, you'll see what I mean. Yeah. So what I'm saying is that you never stand still and you can do the same thing over and over. It's infinite. Right. You can play the Stardust infinitely. Just as if you wanted to play a, a well, see the, the trouble, we're, ta we're talking about two different, two different fish. We're talking about a bass and a swordfish. We're talking about the difference between a classical piece, a so-called, you know, symphonic thing like both Beethoven or Chopin or, or Mozart or whatever. Uh, they're different because those people writing in the tr European tradition. Yeah. We yeah. have now developed a new thing where the musician composes as he writes. Yes. But, Everything is a cadenza. But in the best sense, and in the best jazz improvisers, of course, which I include you and, and, and a handful of other musicians, uh, if we do want jazz to really stand up to the other forms of art, then we have to say that those compositions, the jazz spontaneous composition at its very best mm -hmm. can stand up with the predetermined composition. Yeah, but that's, okay. that's asking an awful lot for yep. a man to extemporize yep. on something because we've now got a thing called records, yep. which we didn't have when Chopin was doing it. Yep. So Chopin had put it on manuscript. Right. Well, if you put it on manuscript, you can erase a bad note. Of course. On a record, you can't do that. Of course. And so it's asking a lot of performer to, to, to vie with a trained composer slowly writing note course, by note. Of course, the of point course. I'm making is simply that we have to take the music itself. Mm -hmm. what, a com what a player, what a performer, a fine performer that is, composes extemporaneously. We have to use different standards to judge that by from what we use for a Mozart or a Haydn. Yeah, but, it, but, but, but I'm not arguing that the music okay. isn't as good. I think uh, it's of its own kind. It's different. Different, right. different is the but, answer. But 
let's say in, in, in the highest echelons, let's, let's say you take your chorus on Stardust, or let's take you, let's take Louis West End Blue. Well, let, well, or let's take Louis Stardust too, where he, yeah. made, he made a great yeah. record of Stardust How about in Louis 1930. Nelson Stardust? Now that's that's surprising to you probably, isn't it? Did you ever hear him do it? Yeah. yeah. Beautiful. I he does it beautifully. Yeah. I, it's I, different. I just, yeah. It's a it country guy singing Stardust, but he sings it with great meaning and great yeah. feeling. So you have to take it on its own terms. Yes, See, but it's very odd. Yeah. Anyway, go ahead. Okay. Your point about Louis. So. <laughs> but but the point about Louis solo or about your solo is that jazz, I think, in its greatest moments with its greatest practitioners, approaches and equals compositionally the me the melodies that a, let's say a Mozart might write or, or someone of that ilk. Of course, not the more complex, poly, you know, uh, many di different voices, well, not moving a, kind of things. Not, but, not, but, but a discipline. Say, not a right. discipline. Well. well, I think your your solo on Stardust. You know, as you, as you said, when you played it, that that's uh, that's a masterpiece. I've heard it myself a thousand yeah, times. Yeah, I can hear and it. I still get a, and I still get a kick out it of it. It never bothers me. In I'll the, put it that way. In the same way that when that when I listen to a, a symphony or a concerto or something that someone else wrote many hundreds of years ago, it still continued. Well, okay. the difference is complexity. Okay, so but when Beethoven writes a symphony or a sonata, he's writing a piece that runs 15, 20 minutes, yes. whereas here we're doing something that lasts at best a minute. Yeah. So, you know, you don't have as much of a, 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 a concentrated, long, oh, of long of amount not. of concentration. Of course, I'm not That's the difference. That. I'm not saying that. I don't think a jazz soloist could ever play something for 20 minutes that would rival a Beethoven sonata. Yeah. No way. Maybe. He'd run Maybe. out of energy. Yeah. No, you keep hearing about it. He played 20 courses, none the like. That's nonsense. I've, I've played and jammed with guys like Lester Young, real masters. And they're not going to play 20 choruses, none of the like. It's funny, it's funny that you mentioned Prez. Let's, yeah, well, he was a great musician. Well, that's know. that's someone that I, that I want to get into. He was, uh, you know, he was a great musician, not just a gentleman, you know. You know Ruby Braff. Sure. You know who he is, anyway. Yeah. And, uh, anyway, uh, just you, you I just mentioned Ru Ruby's name for right. a quick second. Yeah. And uh, I worked with Ruby for a while. We spent a lot of time together at one uh -huh. point. And your records would come over the radio or something, and he... Damn, he say he says, you know, man, he says, you know, Artie, Artie must have heard Prez. He says, let you know, there's there's some well, similar well, thing in there. He he heard you, you 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 heard him, and 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 in some of your playing and the band's playing, especially in that particular time period. And I have a record here I want to play for you. You know, I find some some of the same qualities. And I'd like to ask you about that. But before we get to that, and I realize that we could probably talk for another six hours just about what we were talking very about. Very easy. Sure. Very easily. Uh, I'd like to remind everyone they're listening to Jazz Profiles here on WKCR-FM in New York. 89.9 on your FM dial. My name is Lauren Schoenberg and I'm in the dressing room out here at Westbury Music Fair with the one and only Artie Shaw. And uh, I think I'm talking to Artie Shaw now, not the Artie Shaw he refers to in his book, the pre-processed band leader who became a, a, a fixation for so many millions of people back about 40 years ago, but uh, someone who is going to talk quite candidly about his opinions and uh, and all that. Artie, I'd like to go back now, if we can, and uh, believe it or not, I'm going to assume that most of our listeners have either read your book or are at least famil familiar with your story in some sense, so that I, we don't have to go into all the background that you yeah, go Yeah, the vital statistics are kind of boring to yeah, 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 well, well, And also, mm -hmm. you're very, very candid. Uh, opening up of your life and about what you were feeling. I want to let you know that for myself and many other uh, younger musicians and people, a book like this kind of explains about a lot of things that are going through our heads too. Know that you went through it so many years er 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 earlier. It's been a great help, this book. The, we're talking about The Trouble of Cinderella. But to get down to musical points, and again, talk as technically uh, as you feel comfortable with, uh, let's talk about your clarinet playing, about how you started on the alto sax and you had to learn to double the clarinet in one of the bands you played in, then you picked it up. At first, it was awful, and yeah, uh, pretty tough. <laughs> yeah, I asked tough. Dick one time, Dick Johnson, Dick Johnson, who was leading my present band. I said, Dick, you know, I've been asked by many people, why do they, why do you think the clarinet is no longer uh, as in, you know, important an instrument in modern jazz playing? And Dick said what I've often said it's too hard because it's too hard. It's too hard. <laughs> too hard. <laughs> New England accent. The fact of the matter is, I believe it's not only too hard. But uh, it's a it's a, an instrument you can't you can't fudge you can't fuzz it. No. It's the name clarinet means clear. It comes from the word cloudy clear. Uh, see on trumpets you can fuzz notes. Listen to Miles. Listen to Diz. When they fuzz a lot. You can do that with a tenor. You can do it with a baritone. You can do it with an alto to a degree. Trombone is very good for fuzzing notes. Right. Can't do it on a clarinet. 
No. And for some reason, see piano even, you can fuzz. I remember Hank, uh, Hank Jones once played with me, you make a mistake and then repeat it to make people believe you meant it the first time. Right. <laughs> you know? And of course part of jazz is making mistakes and taking the mistakes where they lead you right. and making them into something you wouldn't have done without the mistake. Right. That's something you, I learned that when I was 15. Right. I mean, I learned the principle of it. If you make a mistake, don't look back, use the mistake. They can say, where did that tell me I should be going? Is that, is, is that the same thing as saying that there's no such thing as a wrong note as long as you know where to go from it? Well, it's wrong in your original intent. In the original intent, but, but if, if you're you improvising, you make a new intent out of it. Right, so you yeah. say, all right, I hit a B flat where I meant to hit a B, so I will go from the B flat to a B into the D above it and go to another and that, chord. And that's like like life itself, and that's a, and that's a and philosophy well, of living, too. The Chinese have a way of telling fortunes by throwing down at random a bunch of black and white sticks and they mm -hmm. land in a certain configuration on the floor mm -hmm. or on the rug or wherever it is. And you look at that and that tells you fortune. So if you were to say to a Chinese guy, but that's totally random, how do you know? Life is totally random. You walk out in the street and suddenly a truck comes by and you're dead. Yeah. That's the end of your life. That's random. So all of life is to some degree random. It's what we do with it. We make our luck to a great degree. That's true. And in jazz, you're making luck all the time. Yeah, well, jazz, is, jazz is, has very in, interesting philosophical uh, attributes to of it course. when you think your, about it. You that's know? one of its reasons yeah. for being valid. Right. Another point about that is that if you do learn how to utilize the random part of existence, mm -hmm. you're learning how to cope with living, actually. That's true. Uh, you know, in a microcosmic way, we're talking about the whole ball game. That's right. So let's so let's get you back with with the alto saxophone, and uh, of course your inspiration, sitting in a vaudeville house, someone play oh well that play that tune. It's like a scene, out, scene out of a movie almost. Yeah, and that was a sense. childish inspiration, but, but it was valid. It, it started. Was, you know, it proves something that the motivation doesn't matter as long as you do something good. Right. As long as something good comes, comes out, out of it. it. If the motivation leads you to something bad, then it's a wrong motivation. That's right. wrong. If it right. leads you to murder like it did Manson and that group, then it was a motivation that had no value. Right. But if you have a motivation that's social and it takes you somewhere, why not? What's the so, difference? Someone else could have seen the same saxophone player and gone, and gone to a store and stolen one and, and, and well, that's the same or, motivation. Or, or, or going out and said, I don't care about the saxophone. I want to be up there with those lights with those pretty girls and right. become a rapist. Yeah. Who knows <laughs> what you lead to? Uh, you know, I think it's largely a funny thing on that subject of luck and random for a moment. I was asked to lecture to a group of people at Santa Barbara called the Santa Barbara Screenwriters Association. Mm -hmm. Now, I do a lot of lectures about writing and about living in general, and uh, they tend to get semi-philosophical. And uh, in this particular instance, I really didn't feel I sh should be there. I taught the idea, but they said, no, you're